Next, on current news, an emotional greeting this morning as a dad is reunited with his sons, fulfilling his dying wife's greatest wish. The man had been kept out of the U.S. until now. Amid reports of migrant kids living in poor conditions, there's a clash on Capitol Hill over spending money on the border emergency. Our special coverage of Religious Freedom Week is focusing on Christian persecution in Iraq. An expert will be here warning the faith is disappearing from her homeland. Plus, President Trump is in a war of words with Iran. The news starts right now. Maria Barrigan is getting her dying wish. She's able to hug her husband just one last time. Good evening, I'm Michelle Powers. Up until now, Maria couldn't see her husband, Benjamin. He'd been living in Mexico, deported from the U.S. She's battling terminal cancer, and thanks to a humanitarian waiver, Benjamin's being allowed to see her just one last time. Current News Tim Harfman is here with the story. Tim. Uh, Michelle, it's a heartbreaking story. Maria's fight against cancer is not going well. Doctors are giving her just weeks to live. This morning, though, there was happiness for the Berrigans when their family was united again. An emotional day for the Berrigan family and their friends. The day they've been praying for has arrived. 13-year-old Christian and 10-year-old Daniel waiting anxiously to be reunited with their father Benjamin at New York's JFK Airport. Finally, they're together again. All right. <laughs> Benjamin has been stuck in Mexico for nearly a year after U.S. officials discovered he crossed the border illegally decades ago. He was told he couldn't get a green card for at least 10 years. I'm uh, happy. Uh, was happy for here in New York. Family and friends enlisted the help of doctors and politicians. Benjamin's application for humanitarian relief was expedited. Then came the good news he was coming to New York. I feel like really, um, I don't know how you say, but like just excited. I don't know, like, like I haven't seen him in so long, and since I can see him now, I'm just <laughs> proud. It's just really exciting because to see um, his face again, like personally, because I haven't seen him in a pretty long time. The reason for wanting to return to the U.S., his wife Maria. This photo capturing their emotional embrace as they were together again this morning. Maria has been battling stage four cancer for over a decade. Now doctors are giving her weeks to live. She's a U.S. citizen and an immigrant from Guatemala. Benjamin tried reuniting with his family twice, but he was denied. In Spanish, he says even with approval this time, he feared going through security in Mexico. Esperaron ahí chequeando este la la vista la pues la humanitaria parol como una but they didn't. Now he's back in Brooklyn. Helping to make the dream happen is Amy Lyons, a parishioner at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. She signed up as guardian for the boys so they aren't forced into foster care if their mom passes away. Amy's calling this reunion a miracle. There's not really words. I just, I've never seen anything so hopeful and beautiful probably in my life. But their fight isn't over. Benjamin is only approved to stay in the U.S. until mid-July. Amy and their friends are trying to extend his stay. To be with his boys when and if his wife passes to help them through that grieving process and to just have the time that that takes. For now, they'll cherish every second they have together. It's exciting and I'm hoping to spend his, uh, my time with him. The boys say they'll use part of that time bringing Benjamin to their martial arts classes so he can watch Daniel receive his blue belt. But of course, Michelle, most of that time uh, will be focused on taking care of Maria. And how long will Benjamin be able to stay in the United States? Uh, well, right now that's unclear. Uh, Amy told me that everyone's doing what they can to reach out to immigration lawyers for help, uh, and they're focusing all of their attention on uh, making sure that Benjamin can stay here even longer. We'll make sure to follow up on this story. All right, there in our prayer. Thank you, Tim. There's a furor tonight over conditions at the U.S. southern border and how to fix the crisis. Amid reports of detained migrant kids living in shelters that are being called unconscionable, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are clashing with one another 
Emily Schmidt reports the latest from Washington. Independent monitors called conditions for migrant children inside a border station in Clint, Texas, unconscionable. We need On Capitol Hill, Democrats echo a call for change. There is no soap. There is no diapers. Above all else, there is no human decency. A facility official said in a Tuesday call with reporters there is soap and water available. But another official said they're not set up for a crush of migrants and unaccompanied children. The question in Washington is what to do about it. It's about lifting them up in a way that takes them beyond what we do today. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is trying to get enough support for a multi-billion dollar border funding package by month's end. She's up against Republicans who question her push for a House bill instead of a Senate plan. She's waited 56 days to run out the clock. This is not a time to play politics. House Democrats disagree on the bill, too. Some say it doesn't do enough to protect migrants and that it's more money for a system already broken. The Trump administration warned Tuesday it may veto any bill which passes partly because there's not enough money for immigration and customs enforcement detention beds. At an Oval Office event, President Trump called for help toughening immigration laws. Our laws are so bad. What we would like to do, and I'll, let, I'll do it right now officially, is ask the Democrats to give us uh, help on asylum, help on all of the loopholes. In Washington, Emily Schmidt, Currents News. The acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, John Sanders, is stepping down from his post. The shakeup is in the wake of those reports about migrant children being detained in housing that's being called squalid and unsafe. This last day will be July 5th. No replacement has yet to be named. The Planned Parenthood abortion clinic in St. Louis could finally be closed this Friday. Missouri health officials want to shut it down over concerns about patient safety. Planned Parenthood is in court trying to keep performing abortions. The judge in the case has set 5 p.m. Friday deadline for a final decision on the clinic's fate. A Catholic community continues to mourn tonight after a charter bus drove off of a Colorado interstate and into a ditch. Two people were killed and 11 others injured. Now the deceased are being identified, the bus driver Anthony Padilla and a seminarian with the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, Jason Paul Marshall. Tom was the seminarian's friend. At the hospitals that we were calling, he was at he wasn't at any of the hospitals. That's Tom Gallegos, a member of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe and roommates with Jason Marshall. Marshall was a seminarian aspiring to priesthood. Coming back to Mass on a regular basis really changed my life. Sunday, he and 14 others, including high school students, were returning to New Mexico after a Catholic youth conference in Denver. Gallegos heard from his friend just moments before tragedy hit. One minute before the crash. And he said, we had a wonderful retreat. It was an awesome retreat, powerful. And I go, wow. And then that was the last time I heard from him sex-wise. Around 2.30 in the afternoon, the charter bus crashed, killing two and sending several others to the hospital. More than 24 hours later, the cause of the wreck is still unclear. As soon as he saw the pictures of the aftermath, Gallego says he immediately knew what happened. I go, I bet you anything Jason went up there to help. And if he was up front and that vehicle crashed the way it did, I saw the pictures, I go, he's the, he's the other victim. Marshall's Church, the University of New Mexico Aquinas Newman Center, will hold a special mass tomorrow night to pray for the victims. I'm sad, but I'm actually happy too. I'm happy that, um, that he's with our Lord. At 53, Marshall was the oldest seminarian with the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. Tonight, there's a war of words between Iran and President Trump after he slapped new sanctions on the Islamic country in retaliation for the missile shootdown of a U.S. drone. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani is hurling an insult, saying the White House actions mean it is mentally retarded. President Trump is tweeting Iran's very ignorant and insulting statement put out today only shows that they do not understand reality. Any attacks by Iran or anything American will be met with great and overwhelming force. In some areas, overwhelming will mean obliteration.
The president is awarding the Medal of Honor to former Army Sergeant David Balavia. He's the first living Iraqi veteran to receive the nation's highest honor. Balavia rescued his squad in 2004 when soldiers were trapped by the enemy in Fallujah. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is meeting with 9-11 first responders today after John Stewart's plea for Congress to do more. The 9-11 Compensation Fund is running out of money, and the law supporting the fund is set to expire next year. There's a new press secretary coming to the White House, Stephanie Grisham. She's being hired to replace Sarah Sanders. Right now, Grisham handles communications for First Lady Melania Trump and will continue to do that job, too. Grisham will be accompanying the president in her new capacity on his trip to Japan and Korea this week. There's a lot more news headed your way. Our special coverage of Religious Freedom Week and how the faith is disappearing from an important place. Aid to the Church in Need is getting help from the U.S. to carry out their great work around the world. And we'll have this celebration in the Brooklyn Diocese. The first and last class coming together for the final graduation at a Brooklyn Catholic school. I'm Emily Drewby and that is ahead. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at thesalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. Graduations are meant to be a time of happiness. For one Catholic Academy class, it's a bittersweet experience. The school is closing, making this year's eighth graders the last to ever receive their diplomas. Currents News' Emily Druby reports they're getting support from the school's very first graduating class, illustrating the enduring strength of a Catholic education. <music> Mary Queen of Heaven's class of 2019 taking their first steps towards the future as a special group of people watched members of the very first class to ever graduate from the school. There is my diploma. Paula Whitney remembers her own commencement moment. She was part of that first graduation. I graduate on June 27, 1954. 65 years later, Whitney and some of her 90 classmates pictured here are back in these pews, this time to cheer on the school's last class. The Catholic Academy officially closing this summer, a decision made because of declining enrollment and severe budget deficits. The Academy has seen a 60% decline in attendance over just a five-year period. Alumni sad to see the school close. They've met up almost every year since graduation, enjoying bonds first established through their Catholic education. They gave us such a basis, and it's the spirit of Mary Queen of Heaven that is entwined between all of us that brings us back here all the time. Holding this year's reunion before and during the last graduation, as Tina Moore explains, to show the students the support the Alumni Network provides and will continue to provide. We're still behind them and uh, encouraging them. Students like Tracy Thompson think for the visit. Excited, honored, happy. <laughs> Those are the three emotions I could really use right now. While the pastor, Father Thomas Leach, says it shows that a Catholic education stays with students. They really love the parish and so they, they've come back to celebrate with them. It's a very sad time, but at the same time, it's great to know that we've had that kind of effect on people's lives. Proving while this is the last class to graduate, the love, support, and faith fostered by Mary Queen of Heaven will always remain. In Flatlands, Emily Drewby, Currents News. This is Religious Freedom Week in the United States, organized to put a spotlight on the dangers facing the Christian faith. In our special coverage, a top Catholic leader in Iraq has a harrowing prediction. He is saying Christianity in his land is close to extinction. It's just the latest bad news about religious persecution. Bombing after bombing around the world. Just the most recent pattern of attacks against modern day Christians. Making 2019 the bloodiest year yet for believers. Religious persecution knows no boundaries. It respects no faith. It attacks everyone 
So unfortunately, we're seeing a rising tide of persecution around the world. Officials around the world agree the persecution of Christians is nearing genocide. Knox Thames is a U.S. special advisor for religious minorities. He says religious freedom is one of the most violated liberties in the world, especially in Iraq. <laughs> In the birthplace of Christianity, the faith is facing extinction. Since the U.S.-led invasion toppled Saddam Hussein's regime, the Christian community there has dwindled from 1.5 million to less than 120,000. Despite the fact that the Islamic State terror group has been defeated in the country, the Archbishop of Erbil, Bashar Warda, believes there is still a fear stopping Christians from coming home. Fear the Islamic State will return and attack again. He says, quote, one of the oldest churches, if not the oldest church in the world, is perilously close to extinction. Those of us who remain must be ready to face martyrdom. Pascal Warda, a Christian and former minister in the country, echoes his concerns. There are still members of the Islamic State in hiding. The spirit that exists already is, is there. Any um, Muslim who will not see his, uh, his neighbor like his brother, like uh, uh, citizens, like uh, partnership in the, in the same uh, land and the same rights, he can do this in any, in any time. Archbishop Warder accuses the world's leaders of political correctness, saying many will not speak out for Christians in fear of being labeled Islamophobic. <laughs> The Archbishop also challenged a group of British leaders asking if they would ever carry signs that say, we are all Christians. Now, one woman has personally witnessed the persecution of Christians. Zina Karakos, a Chaldean Catholic born in Baghdad, she's now living in Troy, Michigan, and is the president of the Iraqi Christian Foundation, an organization that provides aid and advocates for Iraqi and Syrian Christians. She joins us now. Zina, describe for us what it is currently like being a Christian in Iraq today. Since 2003, since the Iraq war began in 2003, Christians in Iraq have faced a very brutal genocide. That's what it is. Absolutely has been a genocide. And then since 2014, then uh, we've also had ISIS that added on to the genocide of Christians in Iraq. So life in, for Christians in Iraq right now uh, means discrimination based on faith. It means a lack of opportunities in terms of jobs. Christians are very discriminated against when it comes to jobs. Uh, in the northern part of Iraq, um, ISIS, when they came through in 2014, they destroyed many Christian uh, towns, homes, churches. So it's, it's a matter of just survival on a day-to-day -day basis for Christians right now in Iraq. So, Zina, a lot of people would think that the U.S. ousting Saddam Hussein from Iraq was a good thing for Iraqi Christians. But do you think that's true? No, I do not think that's true. Uh, definitely the situation for Christians before 2003 was much, much better than what it is after. Um, Saddam Hussein was a uh, brutal dictator, yes, but he um, he was more focused on his political opponent. So if someone was not a political opponent, he pretty much left that community alone. Christians uh, are, Iraqi Christians are a very peaceful, predominantly non-political community. Uh, Saddam Hussein knew that. He, he left the community alone, treated them equally as with other Iraqi citizens. And Christians had the same opportunities to education and jobs as other Iraqis prior to 2003. And that just has not been the case. See, now, pers difference. a personal question for you. You left Iraq when you were two years old and you've been back several times. But would you ever go back to live there? It's, it's difficult for me because I grew up in the United States uh, for me to ever go back and live in Iraq. I I mean, I think it's, it's already tough for the Christians who are there to live there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, I consider myself a Chaldean American. Um, my ethnicity is Chaldean. But I definitely have an attachment to the ancient churches that are in Iraq, the, 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 the heritage, my heritage, my community's heritage is still there. But for myself, it would be quite difficult. And, 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 and sadly, as I mentioned, for Christians there, it's quite difficult. So what is your hope for the future there? We've been uh, Christians for 2,000 years. Uh, we are one of the early Christians. And so the, the hope is that we, we can continue, that the culture can continue in Iraq. Um, but it's going to continue to need a lot of help from the diaspora as well as uh, Western aid organizations. And, 
such and the Catholic Church, which has been tremendously helpful to the Catholic and other Christian uh, Christians in Iraq. My last question for you, very quickly: How can people at home, do you think, best help these persecuted Christians so far from them? Um, I think raising awareness um, is very helpful. Praying, please keep Iraqi and Syrian Christians in your prayers. Um, if you can, you know, if, if the audience can support the Christians in any way, uh, please go to, you know, the website at IraqiChristianFoundation.org. Um, and see, you can find more information there about how to help. Um, but I, I definitely think there's things we can do, such as praying and donating when, when we can um, to the cause. All right, Sina, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Aid to the Church in Need does a great job of assisting Christians around the world. Now they're getting help from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB, USCCB approving $5.2 million of funding for aid to the church in need projects in Central and Eastern Europe. The money will go to programs for poor kids and people with disabilities. Still to come on Current News, a warning that seniors will want to hear. It's about prescription drugs and dementia. The 96-year-old man who is dedicating himself to giving away thousands of the most prominent religious symbol. A new study says some commonly prescribed drugs have a higher risk of causing dementia. Published in a leading medical journal, researchers say there is a nearly 50% higher chance of dementia for patients who take a daily dose of drugs like antidepressants and medications to treat vertigo, motion sickness, and bladder conditions. Finally tonight, a 96-year-old man is on a mission, giving away as many handmade pocket crosses as he can to his Ohio community. He started the hobby after his wife died, but Tony Picluto says he's blessed and he's trying to pay it forward 13,000 crosses at a time. I make crosses to give away. Oh, okay. They're called pocket crosses. I heard a couple people put it in their pocket and they keep rubbing it till all the stains off of it. Right now, I'm up to 13,000. I, I can't keep up with the demand. Tony is one of the most incredible people I've ever met. He, he, he's full of energy, he's 96 years old. He mows his own yard, he does his own cooking, and he works in that shop of his, his garage. He, he cuts out these crosses every day, and it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. I'll be 97 in July. I got it made. I, I'm, I, I'm blessed. I don't take no money, because I, I won't take a cent for him. See, I'm blind in one eye, too. It makes it harder to follow that line. I got a good friend, Al Williams. He runs a, a sawmill and he gives me all my wood free. I furnish the wood and Tony does the work. And I think everyone has one of his crosses. Tony's known throughout, uh, you know, the area. An everyday person that just is on a mission. Well, thank you, that's cool that you do that. I'm, I'm hoping, by, buddy, if I You're live welcome. that long that I'm half that yeah. active. Enjoy your crosses. Thank yeah. you. God bless him. Tony, I need one of those. Before Tony started making and giving away crosses, he made birdhouses for the public. He says he gave away around 1,000 of those. That is Current News. I'm Michelle Powers. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.